Welcome to Small Business Celebration. We're continuing our series with small business owners who are getting the move on. And our guest this week, well, he owns an aviation business and uses some of those skills in that business from what he learned from restoring old Ford pickup trucks. This is Small Business Celebration. Welcome where we chat with real business owners who have real success and learn from them about what works, what doesn't, and who want you to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. Join us where you can learn something that you can use today to grow a strong and profitable business. Welcome to Small Business Celebration, and our guest this week is Ryan Crowell, the president of Bakersfield Jet Center. Welcome to Small Business Celebration. Thank you. And for visitors who don't know who you are, who are you, and what is it that you do? So I am Ryan Crowell, and I'm president of Lloyd's Aviation. Uh, we are also Bakersfield Jet Center, and I've been here for 17 years. First of all, you came out here to learn how to fly? Not quite. Okay. Well, so my family, my mom's family is from Bakersfield. Oh, okay. You know, it was a big farming family, came out from Oklahoma and Arkansas in the 1920s. Right. Along with everyone else, and, and that's how I got my start in Kern County. What brought you here to Lloyd's Aviation and Bakersfield Jet Center? So the founder of Lloyd's Aviation was Byron Lloyd. Right. He started the company in 1958 when I was nine, a long time after 1958. <laughs> He gave me my first flight in an airplane. Okay. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do that. Ah. So I went to school in Arizona, got my degree in aeronautical science okay. and learned to fly. Right. And then after I graduated, I instructed at the university uh -huh. for almost five years. Okay. And Byron said, you need to meet my son, Steve, who was running the company. Right. And he introduced us. And Steve said, I've been thinking about starting a flight school. Yeah. So would you like to do that? Right. I said, sure. I'm, a, I'm already teaching. <laughs> sure. I kind of have this, this inkling that I liked business. Right. And the chance to start my own. Ah. He said, come on out. So that's how I got here. Why on earth would you want to take the risk and start the business or, you know, take another existing business and build a brand new offshoot? from the original business? Well, that question implies that there was a lot more forethought into <laughs> the decision than there actually was. It was a chance to do something new. Okay. But, and it, I didn't really know how it would go. I showed up and he said, start a flight school, go. <laughs> and that was kind of my instructions. Right. So it was really a, an interesting process and a learning process to start a business with somebody else's money. That was fun. Oh, hey, yeah. what, what business owner doesn't want to do that? Right. So that was fun. Um, I learned a lot. Right. I made most of the decisions, right? Like 51%. That's all that counts, that's all, right? That's all it takes. Yeah. Now, visioneers, you may hear airplanes in the background. You may hear that we're really echoey. And the reason is, is we're in a flight hangar here at Bakersfield Jet Center. And the building that we're standing in, this is not one of the very first original buildings for Bakersfield Jet Center. This is version generation three, generation four? Yeah, something like that. This, this was built in the mid to late 90s. Right. Uh, we have some newer hangars than this and then uh, some that are quite older than that, that, all, that date all the way back to the 50s. And how long has Bakersfield Jet Center, or your part of the company, how long has that existed? So the company's been here since 1958. Right. I've been here since 2005. Right. And our company started out just offering some flying services, then selling parts. Well, what are flying services? Really just providing pilots for people's airplanes. Okay. So that's how, kind of how we started, how Byron started. Right. Then he started selling some parts out of his office, built a few hangars and some shade ports to house airplanes. Right. Then we started into the maintenance business and then the charter business. Oh. And just one thing into, led into the other. And where did you fit in with this flight training? Because nowhere in any of that did I hear, oh, we train pilots. Right, and we don't <laughs> anymore. Okay. Uh, other than our own pilots that we hire. Right. And we obviously train them as professionals, but they already have their licenses when sure. we get them. You, you fine tune them. Yeah. Because the pilots that you have, 
you're, you're not trying to teach the pilots how to go from point A to point B. There is a lot more involved, or more nuance. What are some of the things that you train your pilots for? We are taking already commercially certified pilots, right. and we're trying to turn them into professional corporate pilots. And what's the difference? So there's, there's a difference between a pilot that works for an airline that wants to close the cockpit door and have limited human interaction. Right. That's not the kind of person I want. Sure. I want the pilot that I can put in front of the owner of a multi-million dollar airplane and they can not only act professionally, but they can make competent decisions in the cockpit and of course fly the airplane well. You've been involved in this business since 2005. Yes. And you've expanded your parts and you've grown. Yeah. For better or for worse, they promoted you. They did. I just. <laughs> It started out with this kind of free reign to start the flight school, which right. we later shut down. Well, um, why did you sh shut it down? So flight training is probably the hardest place in aviation to make money, first of all. Okay. Today it's a little easier because the whole world's short of pilots. Ah, but it's, a, it's a good time to be a pilot. It is. Um, but in 2008, 2009, right. we shut it down and uh, the economy was tanking, instructors were hard to keep. Right. There wasn't a lot of money in it to begin with, um, so it just made sense to shut it down. But in the meantime, I had learned other parts of the business, and I kept saying yes to things, for better or for worse, <laughs> um, to, to learn new things and take on new responsibilities. And throughout that, um, I took over as president in 2016. And That's a pretty quick, quick rise. About 11 years, yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Um, thank you. It, uh, it, it's been a learning process, but I will say the thing that was really nice is that Steve Lloyd gave me the freedom to try new things. Right. To explore, sometimes to make mistakes. Right. But I had this freedom to work within the business to make things better the way I thought they should be, to tweak things, to try new things. Um, and, and that was really unique, I think. When we come back, we're going to elaborate on something that Ryan is just talking about, giving your employees the opportunity to fail. But before we do that, Ryan, if visioneers want to learn more about Lloyd's Aviation and the Bakersfield Jet Center, how do they do that? So you can find us at bakersfieldjetcenter.com. Okay. We're also on Facebook and LinkedIn. You can find us there too. And if you enjoy a small business celebration, go ahead and like, subscribe, and notify. And when we come back, yeah, how do you kick the employee off the cliff while giving them the wings to fly? The winter season is rapidly approaching, but are the tires on your car or truck ready for wet weather? Bakersfield's best tire store, Clareau Tire, has been serving families like yours for 80 years and installs and services the tires your family depends on when the wet weather comes. Give Clareau Tire a call at 661-324-6069 and ask them about what tire works best for you and your budget. Call Clareau Tire at 661-324-6069 or visit them at 530 East 21st Street in Bakersfield or at ClareauTire.com today. The wet winter weather is rapidly approaching. Call Clareau Tire at 661-324-6069 today. I'm here with Ryan Crowell, the president of Bakersfield Jet Center and Lloyd's Aviation. And our visionary question comes from Michelle who asks, we often hear that we need to give our employees the opportunity to fail. What do you do to give your employees the opportunity to fail without the threat of crashing your business? Pun well taken. <laughs> so, I couldn't um, help myself. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it is a little bit different of an implication for us. Right. Because... I think most of our customers don't want us to let our <laughs> employees fail, right? right if sure. we're fixing or flying airplanes or fueling airplanes, that's kind of a problem if we fail. For some but, reason, the FAA frowns on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it is a little bit different. The consequences are huge, obviously. Right. Everybody makes mistakes, though. And we are very, very focused on preventing mistakes. Right. Everything we do is about preventing that. Right but we're all human, we know there will be mistakes. Right. So I learned from a pilot mentor of mine right. who said it very well, it's not about who's right, it's about what's right. Ah. And so what we want right. is how do we get the what? What happened? Ah. 
So what we have is a very robust safety management system. Right. So we have a very easy way for employees to tell us what happened. They can do it anonymously or not. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of reports. Most of them are very, very small things. But every now and then we get one where we go, huh, that could be really Big. bad right. if we don't fix that. Right. Um, but everybody has the ability to do that. And they have to be able to communicate that back to us right. in a way. And then it's on us to, to build the trust with them so that they can do it right. without the fear of losing their job the next day. You're the successor from I Steve am. Lloyd. Yes. When Steve invited you, he invited you to come start a flight school and said, here, start a flight school. Yeah. And that's giving you the opportunity to fail. Mm -hmm. As your growth through the company and now president and, and the successor to Steve, what are you doing to help your employees have that same opportunity? So we try and build uh, uh, an environment, a culture, right. and a culture is really tough to build. It takes a lot of time. Right. Anybody that tells you it can happen, you know, read this five-step book to build a culture <laughs> is lying through their teeth. Right, right. It takes a lot of time right. and you have to be diligent about it, but building a place where people can come and say, hey, I had this idea. Ah. And even if you know in the back of your mind, you're going, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I've seen this movie before yeah. and it doesn't or end well. Or I've already tried it and failed because <laughs> sure, that's right. happened too. Right. Um, kind of measuring yourself to you, oh, that's a great idea. Thanks for bringing that. I've already tried that and failed. Right. Or, um, or maybe the just, timing wasn't right. Maybe yeah. we should try it again. Yeah. Trying not to just say no. Right. Um, a lot of times we're busy and busyness when we're busy and we respond quickly, it comes across as just squashing ideas. Right. It's really hard not to do that. One of the things about this is that you're the successor. Mm -hmm. And did Steve have a plan put in place for your successorship or did he just walk in one day like he did with your flight training school and say, here, you're, you're now the president, have a nice day. No. we. Uh... It, it was a conversation that really developed over time. Ah. It wasn't like I showed up and he goes, you're gonna be the next president. That's not the way it went. Right. You know, and it was years of talking. You mm. know, just because I got the title of president didn't mean it was all done. Hey, look, Here's I got a business, business card, card. Yeah, yeah. that says I got president on it. Right. Yeah, no, it, it, it didn't work that way. It was a slow transition to where he began to give me more and more and I asked him less and less. Uh. Sure. Um, and it was, but there was always a plan. Now the plan changed a lot. Right. As we tried to figure out, not just the succession, but the transfer of ownership. Oh, okay. So it was, the, the plan changed a lot. You know, we, I, th I think we tried about every one of them. And Like you were just talking about, I've tried that before and it doesn't work. Right. So it was, it was something that morphed. And I, I actually asked him one time. Right. I said, how did you know when you hired me that it was going to work? He goes, I didn't. You never know. You right. never know for sure. Right. And I thought about that and I went, well, I guess, I mean, you can do the best you can, but you re never really know when you hire somebody, even if you're looking for an ex a successor, which I don't think he was right. when he hired me. Right. I know he wasn't. Right. Um, it, it never really, you never, you're never sure. Part of not being sure is also knowing when to ask for help. You gotta be able, you gotta build a network around you mm. of people that have been there and made those mistakes. Right. And I think what's important is to have the people that don't always tell you yes, that's mm. a great idea. Right. You gotta have people in your little world, right. your business world, right. that can tell you no, that's stupid. <laughs> Ryan, that you is know? the most harebrained thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. And I, I describe this the way it, it pictures in my head right. of running an organization, a company, or, or I guess suppose any organization, but specifically a company that could fail. Right. It's like standing on the edge of a cliff right. and looking over a great chasm right. to great opportunity on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you can see that opportunity and you can see the potential, but you can also see the failure. Right. 
and the potential keeps you going and the failure that could come makes you make sure that you're making good decisions. But some people get to the edge of the cliff right. as they ascend an organization and they go, that's scary. I can't handle that right. because that's more overpowering than the opportunity right. and they can't handle that. How did you learn the lesson of being willing to pick up the phone and ask for help? Because I didn't know. I took on things that I didn't know. I really didn't. But at what point, I'm sure there's a, a point or an instance where you had a project that came up or, an, or a situation that came up, whether it's an employee or whatever, that came up and you're like, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, so I mean, my training when I got here was all on the flying side. Right. I had some business classes in college, but it was, I was a trained pilot. Hmm. I was not a trained business person. So I read ah, books, right. but I found people and Steve would introduce me to people ah. and say, you need to know this person. You need to know this person. He had built a network. Right. And then I slowly built my own, right. starting with people that he knew. Right. And you, you find trusted people in certain areas of business that you can just call. And I've got them on my short list of, of you know, oh crap, <laughs> <laughs> this happened. Or, sure. you know, you just, you gotta have people that, that have stood on the cliff before. Right. And that get it. And they know where the stones are. You gotta have, and it really doesn't matter, business or otherwise, you have to have people that have gone before you, that have a few more gray hairs and a few more birthdays than you. Sure. That have made the mistakes. Um, or logged a lot more flight time. Yeah, yeah. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the status quo. Do you keep it, do you rail against it, or is it something that you use as a benchmark? When we come right back. The reason we're here talking with Ryan Crowell, the president of Bakersfield Jet Center, is because of a visioneer question that came from a visioneer just like you. We had a visioneer that wanted to find out, how do I disrupt the status quo without alienating my customers? So if you've got a question, you've got a thought, something you'd like to learn about here on Small Business Celebration, reach out to us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, and let us know. Who knows, your question could appear here on Small Business Celebration. So reach out to us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram today. I'm here with Ryan Kral, the president of the Bakersfield Jet Center and Lloyd's Aviation. And our visioner question comes from Fernando who asks, how have you successfully rebelled against the status quo without alienating your customer base? Yeah, and I th that's an interesting question. Um, I'll tell you a story from quite a while ago. Okay. So, the, the, well, first of all, corporate aviation is kind of this good old boy club. Okay. And well, there's only a certain number of people who can afford a multi-million dollar jet and pay cash for it. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got two, right? Yeah. So, but it's it's kind of it. It is. It, I don't want to make it sound ex so exclusive that no one can get into it, but it is kind of this culture where. A handshake is pretty much all you need. Right. And sometimes that's really good. Sure. But sometimes it's really not when you're trying to collect money. <laughs> sure, sure. So we had this culture that uh, in our maintenance shop, for example, people would bring airplanes in from, and we have airplanes come in from all over the state of California and outside of California. They sure. come in for retail maintenance. Right. And they come in and they say, oh, well, great. Thanks for fixing my airplane. I'll send you a check. And for a lot of years, we just said, cool, send us a check. And then we sat there and waited and waited 30, and 60, waited and 90, waited, 80, right? Hopeful, right? So we said, we, this can't happen anymore. We can't continue to finance this. Everybody's got to pay for the airplane when they pick it up. And you, you, it do, was, that for, you do that it, with a hotel, it, rental car? I know, it doesn't sound that shocking, sure. but in our culture, it was. Right. And there's some big OEMs out there that really foster that kind of culture. Sure. They're like, I will send you a bill. In other words, they, they don't want you to know what it costs yet. <laughs> we, that's usually the catch. But so we, we were like, look, we, we want to be paid for what we just did. Right. And that we, we got some really 
strong kickback initially. Sure. And they say, I'm going somewhere else. I've been here since Moses was a baby, right? <laughs> you know, so sure. I've been your customer forever. We right. went, great, and we hope you'll continue to do that, but we need you to pay on time. Sounds crazy, right? Right. Novel, but it worked. How many customers did you lose? Maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> At the, in the end of it, it wasn't that big a deal, but man, it was a little, it was a little nerve wracking going through that. This sounds rather odd because this is something a lot of business owners go through every day. They, 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 they're afraid to ask for the check. Yeah, and I get that. I totally get that. It's nobody likes to ask for money. So one of the things we've done over the years is we've set our systems up mm -hmm. so that we don't have to ask for money. Ah. So we get the credit card on file as soon as they did it. The fuel is at the time of service. The charter is paid for up in advance. Right. You don't have to ask for it anymore. Right. Then when we do leases and contracts and, and we put, I, you would be surprised, maybe you wouldn't. Um, I get people ask me, well, how are you dealing with CPI these days? Right. Well, what's That's CPI? a big deal. It's the, the inflation. Right. How, it's the consumer price index. Right. How much is, does inflation affect pricing, which sure. is a big deal right now. Well, and oil well, and fuel prices yeah. are all over the place, yeah. So uh, we all know that costs go up even when inflation's not huge like right. it is now, but we've had that in our contracts for a long time. We put that, slowly was putting that in our contracts. CPI increases every year. And it was minimal until this year. Right. And now everybody's concerned about it. We go, oh, well, that's been in our contract for a long time. Right. You make your policy so you don't have to ask for money. It makes life a lot easier. When you're not here at Bakersfield Jet Center, what do you do for fun? I have a lot of projects. <laughs> okay, all right. So I have a wood shop in my garage that has been neglected because I've been working on my hobby of old Ford trucks. My wife might call it an addiction. Old Ford I, trucks? I have, well, old by my standards, which I mean, not super old well what is 70s old? and 80s okay all right so the, I, where I, they start just started developing fuel injection yeah, and computer yeah. fuel okay yeah, yeah i got got some of those got some of those that are carbureted and right. so that's kind of my thing i like right? to do that what got you involved with that so i had a very close relationship with my grandfather okay and he and i spent a lot of time together and he had this 85 f-150 right that uh, I was, let's see, I was 11 when he bought it. And I thought it was the coolest thing, right. mainly because it was his. Right. And after he passed away, I wanted the truck. And he goes, what do you want with the, but before he pet died, he asked me, he knew I wanted it. Right. And he said, what do you want with a worn out old work truck? I said, well, it was yours. That's what, I, and so I've slowly restored that over time and my kids have helped me work on it and it's just been a really fun thing. It's, it's sentimental I know, and I know it's kind of crazy to be that attached to something, but it reminds me of someone who was really important in my life. This truck isn't the only truck that you've worked on. No. How many trucks have you done? Uh, I have three currently. And you've got how many rusting, in, I mean, parked <laughs> in, the, in, in the back? Uh, I have three. <laughs> right. Two of which are running. Okay. Yeah, so we're... Uh, uh, I, I enjoy it. There's something satisfying about doing, fixing something, right. making something that, that wasn't that pretty or wasn't working work and make right. it look nicer. Right. Um, there's just something satisfying in that. And I think that any work can be satisfying. Um, that's part of the enjoyment of work. What have you learned? from restoring these trucks that you apply to your business? Hmm. I guess I never really made the correlation. Um, there's, you, you gotta find something that you like to do. Hmm. And I know everybody says that. Right. It is cliche. It is. But it's cliche for a reason. It is, because I mean, when I, when I was a kid, I, I was always in, had this fascination with airplanes. Right. When I played Little League, it was under the traffic pattern for the local airport. Right. And so I'm standing in the outfield. And this, is, this is why I don't play professional <laughs> baseball, by the way, right? Sure, right, right. This and other reasons. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I would stand there and watch the airplanes go over. And there's just some, something really cool about doing that. But it's not to say that y your childhood interests are your, the same interests for your whole life. Right. 
but you have passions and interests and, and finding a way to work in those is really satisfying. What makes you wake up every morning and open your business? I think you, there's this thing about airplanes that is really hard to get out of your system. Mm. Um, you know, there's this, it's, it's like an addiction. Okay. I will say that. There's, you feel better when, <laughs> when you just landed an airplane right. and you did it well. Right. Um, there's a mystique around aviation. At least I like to tell myself. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's this idea that we do something that's pretty cool. Right. And the machines are great. The people that we get to work with are really great. Right. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefits to owning any business most of them aren't what people think. Right. You know, it's not really about the money or the status or the title, at least not for me. Right. I mean, some of that's kind of cool. Um, but meeting people that I would never get to meet if I didn't do this. Right. Is, is pretty fun. Um, getting to fly airplanes that I could never afford on my own right. is pretty fun. And going the places and meeting the people, I could tell you stories about people that I've met that are just so interesting. Right. And I think that's what it is. I guess if you had to say it's, it's, it's there's really interesting people in it. Ryan, this has been fun. If visioneers wanted to learn more about you and the Bakersfield Gent Center, how do they do that? So uh, again, you can go to our website, BakersfieldJetCenter.com. Okay. Um, our company has a LinkedIn page. I have a LinkedIn account if you want to send me a message. Um, we're on Facebook as well. So yeah, they can get a hold of us there. This has been a real treat. Thank you for joining us here on Small Business Celebration. Thanks for having me. And I'll be right back with my final thought. The winter season is rapidly approaching. But are the tires on your car or truck ready for wet weather? Bakersfield's best tire store, Clareau Tire, has been serving families like yours for 80 years and installs and services the tires your family depends on when the wet weather comes. Give Clareau Tire a call at 661-324-6069 and ask them about what tire works best for you and your budget. Call Clareau Tire at 661-324-6069 or visit them at 530 East 21st Street in Bakersfield or at ClareauTire.com today. The wet winter weather is rapidly approaching. Call Clareau Tire at 661-324-6069 today. The Stepping Stones. Here we are in the final episode of season four here on Small Business Celebration. And during my conversation with Ryan today, we had a wonderful conversation about getting to the edge of the cliff, the precipice, and seeing what lies in the future and, and beyond, and sometimes having fear and trepidation about taking that leap or going off the cliff into nowhere land, not realizing that yeah, there are stepping stones across that chasm that we may not initially see. And as we grow into the next season of Small Business Celebration, it's one of those things that each of us needs to remember and realize. Yes, there's great opportunity on the other side of the great cliff, on the other side of the great chasm. But in order to get there, we need friends, we need acquaintances, colleagues, advisors, people who can give us the insight we need. We need those people to be our stepping stones across the great chasm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ryan Krell, with the president of Bakersfield Jet Center, and I hope you learned something that you can use today to grow a strong and profitable business, and we'll see you here again for the beginning of Season 5. By the way, if two wrongs don't make a right, okay. but three rights make a left, mm -hmm. 
how many rights does it take to make an airplane? Mm, two. Orville, I looked at your notes. Orville and <laughs> you Wilbur. You cheated! <laughs> and they are? Orville and Wilbur. Orville and Wilbur. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> Welcome to 